Have you ever promised something to somebody and you didn't really think that they were going to call you out on it when the time came? And you said it at the moment, you know, to be polite, but you just figured that they'd forget about it. And then like two days right before you speak at a chapel, they actually do call you out about it because it really meant something to them. And even though it didn't mean anything to you at the time, they remembered and now you have to wish somebody happy birthday. Well, that happened to me right now. And so I want to say happy birthday to Connor Hunter. If he's here. There. Connor, happy 20th. 19. <laughs> That's pretty much what I said. Um, so yeah, go crazy uh, within the boundaries of the Community Covenant. So <laughs> make sure you don't dance in a way that's out there and be home by 12 or else. Um, or one, gosh. I just, <laughs> do I even go here? <laughs> do I even know you people? I don't think so. <laughs> Sorry, Pastor, I'm going to have to step down right now. But... Uh, no, congratulations, Connor. You're probably the only freshman to have ever been honored by being called out in a senior class chapel before. So, you are now a legend. <laughs> Tell your grandchildren and stuff. Well, it hit me the other day. Um, I was just sitting and thinking about how the best way to approach God is. And I was thinking about how um, Samuel, as a boy, was called by God. And when he heard God, he said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And um, it's always a good thing to both listen to God and to listen for God. And our passage today, I think, is going to help to accomplish how we can do both of those things. Um, my hope is that despite this message, that uh, our passage today will haunt you in a, in a good way, not in a bad way, but in a way that uh, the verses will just kind of stick with you and that um, they'll kind of just echo in the back of your head um, after this chapel. Um, there's a lot of richness in these words, and um, the picture it presents of Jesus is such a precise and amazing picture of who Jesus really is. And even if we didn't have much else to go off of in the Bible about who Jesus is, well, this would tell a ton about um, his nature and how he is towards us. So please turn to Matthew 11. Um, we'll also have it up there on the screen. And it reads this way. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give to you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. Lord, today we give to you. Today we put away ourselves, and Lord, we just want to draw near to who you are, Help us to put away the things that might keep us out of your presence. And Lord, may your spirit just move in us today, both to glorify you and to live like your son. Amen. So today I want to talk about rest. Um, some of our friends are resting right now back at the dorms, sleeping in. Uh, but that's not the rest that I want to talk about. Um, and unfortunately, I'll just tell you this right now, I'm not going to end with any really applicational um, things for you to do. Like, if you want rest, take these three steps or these five things to do for this eternal rest. Um, I'll let you guys handle that because your lives are pretty specific to yourselves. And um, I just think it works better if while we go through this together that you keep this uh, concept of rest in your minds, and then, well, you'll be able to figure out how to use it, I think. You're all pretty smart college kids, and uh, I think you'll do well. 
So, whenever Jesus speaks, it's because he has something to say. It's my brilliant theology that I came up with. Um, and this is true for all of us, but where he and we begin to differ is sometimes when we talk, we don't really talk about anything. Um, I find this happens a lot at parties, that uh, you'll meet somebody and uh, they'll want to engage in small talk with you, and you're standing there listening to them and they're not really saying anything. Um, and I can't do that. I have no ability to be a small talker. Um, I can't really stand in front of a person while she talks about her new dress or some guy about his fantasy football team. And I might look interested, but it's only because I'm trying to be polite. <laughs> I don't know if that makes me unchristian. Sometimes people think Christian and polite are the same thing, but I'm not so sure about that. So. Anyway, it's really all about the things that you value. Those are the things that's going to really get your attention. If I really value dresses, which, I mean, to an extent, I appreciate dresses, I guess. Um, <laughs> if I really value them, then yeah, I guess they'd be a big, a big deal, and I would enjoy talking about them. If I had a final fantasy football team, or fantasy football team, um, ah, stop, stop. If I had one of those, and they were a winning team, then yeah, I'd definitely talk about that. If I had one that was a losing team, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> but, um, you know, if we really value Jesus' words, we'll listen to him. When he speaks, and whatever he speaks, will be of ultimate importance to us. Um, because his words bring life to us. Uh, they bring encouragement. They cause us to praise and to be convicted and to ultimately look to him. Now this passage is peculiar and interesting because Jesus is doing something here that he doesn't do in most other places. Usually when he talks, it's, he's declaring something or it's a statement. He's giving a command or he's condemning a certain people group. But this is interesting because he's not doing any of those things. What he's doing is he's entreating the listener. He's offering something to them. He's inviting them to him. Um, so that makes it important to me because it's something that really sticks out in Scripture. And it's not just something that sticks out about anybody, but about Christ. And so um, I think there's something really here that we need to hear and to listen to. So here our Lord waits for us. He's patiently waiting. He's both ready to be known and wanting to be known. Um, he stands by the road with life and he calls out to us. He's, he's not screaming for us at the top of his lungs, but he's not really whispering it either. Um, he's not commanding us to come and he's not, he's not begging us to come either. Like uh, he's at our mercy. He's offering, he's inviting, he's, he's there not in an advertising way, but in a way that he's calling because we have a need and he knows it and he has something for us. I find that we often pass by things that are beautiful in this world. Um, I was thinking that I'm now, you know, a bit over 21 years old and I was thinking about all the sunrises that I've seen. And to be honest, I don't think I've seen more than a dozen, a dozen 21 years. I mean, it's not like the sun takes a day off. It's always, it always rises. But, um, yeah, just the things that we pass, the things that distract us. Um, we miss a lot of real beauty in this world. A couple semesters ago, Dr. Dixon talked about um, this guy named Joshua Bell, a brilliant violinist. And um, in this study, this, this thing that he did was... Um, he went to a subway and played on one of the most beautiful instruments, like a really, really quality, like million dollar um, violin. He went to the subway and played some of the most beautiful music that this world's ever heard by some of the best composers. And um, thousands of people passed by 
you know, he was in the subway. So everybody's just running through. And within that hour or so, as a thousand people passed by, only a few stopped and listened for a while. And most of those were children. It's outrageous in a way to think that we miss so many beautiful things, but maybe it's not as outrageous as we think. The danger here is that if we miss so much with our physical senses, the things that are really tangible um, that we can see and hear and touch, if we miss those things, then we have to be sure that the spiritual things are not missed as well. Um, So whether intentionally or accidentally, We can't allow Jesus' call here to be drowned out by things in life. We have to make sure that we're open and listening for them. Life is especially dangerous when one believes himself to be safe. Just like a ship on a calm water can still be destroyed by a reef, underground reef that was unseen because no one was vigilant. Um, But I do want to say it's not hard to find God. In fact, I think it's a lot easier than we usually make it out to be. And so maybe in this message, we'll be able to do that bit today. So Christ calls out to us, but where are we to go? It's not as some people think, to heaven or a philosophic state of mind or an emotional feeling. He no doubt wishes for these things to be a part of our life at some point. But he calls us to himself, to a person, not a set of deeds, not a list of things to be done, but he calls us to himself to be intimate with him. What he really wants to do is just introduce himself, much like I could do with you right now. And so we have to listen carefully for him. His voice echoes through scripture, and we can always feel it in our souls when he's near and we enter into a real spiritual moment. And to come to him, I mean, there's nothing better. I would hope as a university that we could testify to this. I know I can. I know that many of you can. But there's nothing more precious or valuable than me, than Christ. And so I want to make sure that I don't neglect his call in anything. Um, If someone were to call you right now on your cell phone, if it was a friend or a best friend, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, uh, whatever of their friends there are, a spouse, a fiance, a superhero, or a, I don't know, president. Anyway, I don't know. But these people, we don't just talk to for like a little while. We don't just pick up and just talk to you for a few minutes, but we can spend hours with these people on the phone. I know some couples that literally fall asleep talking to each other, going late into the night, to the point of physical exhaustion and they wake up the next morning and like the phone's right here and there's like slobber all over it and they're like, what happened? And the person on the other side was all offended because suddenly the other side just went blank and nobody was talking. It's like, wow, wow, that's crazy. But it's not like a bad crazy. It's like there's something really there that's, that's, Tender in a way, you know, something beautiful within that. But this is a question I think we need to all kind of take honestly to really, to really ask this to ourselves. Is if Jesus called us on our phone, as you know, as crazy as that might be, and you knew it, how long would it take for you to pick up the phone? Would you be scared? Would you be happy and joyful? Would you look at it and just be like, what do I do? (laughs) Maybe I'm not at home. Maybe you won't know. (laughs) No. (laughs) Anyway, that is a question that's funny, but it can be extremely convicting too if you honestly ask yourself, what would you do? It really shows where your heart is at if you're honest about that. And so I'll leave you with that question. It comes down to this. Sheep must know and understand their shepherd. They have to be able to learn from the shepherd, you know? And if we learn from Christ, 
and if we consider him our shepherd, then there are burdens that we don't have to bear. If Christ is our shepherd, we don't have to know where we're going because he'll take us there. If he is our protector, we won't need to defend ourselves or attack our enemies because he will be there for us. We don't have to provide for ourselves because he is our provider. How many burdens do we carry around with us that were never ours in the first place? Things that were never meant for us and that we've taken on ourselves for whatever reason. Probably way too many. Now let's look at why Christ tells us to come to him. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that's it. He doesn't have some kind of diabolical plan to like use us in a weird way. He, he's offering us a blessing, a gift. He wants to give us eternal rest. In verse 29, it makes it apparent that this rest is eternal. And this is a promise. It's an invitation, but it's also a promise. God's desire is to give to us a rest to take off this burden that we have now. Now, my house has mice. I know that was random. <laughs> my house has mice. Not like, it's not like infiltrating and they're crawling everywhere in the cupboards and the beds and stuff. Um, at least I hope not. That would be pretty bad. And uh, obviously, we want to get rid of them. Um, so we put out, you know, like little traps. I didn't want to be lethal traps, but David Wagner thought... I don't even know if he's here. He wanted to make sure that they didn't come back. So, um, you know, we bait them with peanut butter and cheese and peanuts and little things. And then um, we'll kind of like do our own thing, but be quiet enough so that we can hear, you know, the little pitter-patter of their feet when they come. Just so when they come, we can be the great hunters we are and capture them and get rid of them. And so these traps that we use are are illusions of kindness. Like they're not real. We, our promises in our house to our mice, um, you know, they promise nourishment, but they result in death. <laughs> you know? I mean, judge me, whatever. Like, the mice shouldn't be there. You know what I mean? But when Christ puts this out there, you know, he... He, promise, he promises rest, and that promise will result in life, real, tangible, eternal life. But the rest isn't necessarily for this life, and I hope that doesn't shock anybody. It shocked me because I um, was raised in a church that kind of preached the prosperity message, message not preached by Christ, and I thought that you know, to be a Christian in this world meant that you were blessed. It meant that you had financial um, security and that you were healthy and that that was the product of your faith. Suffering wasn't really something that could go hand in hand with that kind of faith. That the rest was for this life. And that was wrong and that was a lie. Um, if you turn back just one chapter to Matthew 10, you see that this is not the kind of life preached by Jesus. Um, it almost seems like the opposite. So our life isn't free of pain and discomfort. In a way, it's full of it. Um, it doesn't even say that life will at least be balanced. Like for every one blessing you receive, there will be a curse. For every wrong there is, there will be a right given to you. Some of us might enjoy that because of how we're feeling right now, and some of us might not. And it doesn't even say that some trials will only last for a season. Some trials, I mean, it would tend to indicate, might be for life. But I'm not saying that the life of a Christian is terrible, necessarily. Um, life was much easier for me before I became a Christian. Because before I became a Christian, I lived for myself. Now that Christ is my master, I have to surrender to him every day. And in some ways, that's really hard because that's not how the world works. And it's, the rest of the world isn't Cedarville. You don't receive the encouragement in other places that you do here. And so it's hard to live this life. We yearn for a world that's not yet here, and we love a God who 
the world despises. So yeah, it is a hard life. But it is the best life because we have that hope. We have that rest ahead of us. We have that new life ahead of us. And because it seems as if this promise is too good to be true, well, because it's from Christ, it must be true, right? Right. And there is pain, but it's the hope that we have to cling to. That's the real stuff. And we need this rest. Maybe we don't feel burdened right now. Some of us have great lives. I mean, I know I feel blessed. I don't go through many trials and tribulations and stuff. I feel like my rest, you know, is pretty good right now. I know it will get better, but right now I don't feel too burdened. But it has been my experience to know that it's hard to know exactly how much weight is on you until it's taken off. Um, I can't bench press too, too much. Um, let's be honest. I mean, I can bench press a lot. There's probably about two or three students here that can bench press more than me. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I do know the difference between a weight that I have and then when 20 pounds is taken off of it. In a way, even though there's still weight, there's a relief there. And... Um, this burden, this weight that we have that we might not realize, when you come to Christ, when you come to his forgiveness, and that weight is gone, you'll start to realize how much there was, how much you didn't realize it was killing you. And you'll be so much more thankful for that life and the rest that he gives. For it is so good. Um, one more thing I wish to make clear is that this rest is not wholly out of our hands right now waiting in heaven. This rest is in Christ, and if we are in him, we begin to experience the first taste of it in this life. Um, we can experience release from anxiety and worry and insecurity. Um, we can have a peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding in Christ, and that can comfort us and help us to get through this life. So the rest is eternal. It is waiting ahead of us. But we're also beginning to see the first fruits of it right now. Now, we must talk about how to come to Christ. Um, and we've already heard a couple times the call itself, but I want to make this important. There's only one way to come to Christ, and if you don't come to him in this way, then you're not really coming to him at all. Christ offers us to come as we are, but if we come towards him with proud and hard hearts, then we'll never receive him or his testimony. And to come to Christ, there is a receiving part on our part that we must do. Um, we have to be willing to believe and trust him to be who he says. And until we do that, we won't know the Father. Because it's only through Christ that you'll know the Father. So first, I want to describe to you the kinds of people that come to Christ and the kind that don't. Now, the first kind are those who are weary and heavy laden. But even though we can all be described as this, not all of us will actually hear this call. I can stand up here and go, come to me all, here, all who are weary and heavy laden, or I can do it in chucks, and for the most part, some people will look at me, but there won't be like a direct connection, you know, because I'm just calling out to the masses. But if I say, where is he, Chris Voltz, come to me. I'm just kidding, just stay there for now. It's just, <laughs> just saying that. If I say, come to me, okay, I have his attention now. He's looking at me, he's listening, because he's learned to associate that name with his self. So the only people who are going to hear Jesus' call, the weary and the heavy laden, are those people who've identified themselves as such. It's not just their nature, but they know it's their nature, and they know it's a problem, and they know that there's a burden. It's that call that directly identifies these people that will make them know who they are and what's ahead. Secondly, Christ will appeal to those who wish for rest. Again, I'm not talking about rest as a vacation, but genuine people seeking peace and eternal rest. In my next point, I'm going to go into a positive picture 
of what this person is, but for now I want to give three negative pictures of this person. Now the first is the one that hears Jesus beckoning and calling, but when they hear that he will forgive their sins, they deny him. It's not that they think that God couldn't forgive their sins, but it's because they think that God shouldn't. Um, they don't trust him to make the right judgment call on their nature and their actions. They don't trust God to be a more righteous judge than they are of themselves. And in so doing, they put themselves on the throne of Christ and deny his justice and his mercy and put up their own. This person will not come to Christ, even if he's looking. The next group is the group that wishes for rest, but they do so in a manner that I call the restless searchers. Um, it's these that they hear Jesus calling they hear his promise of rest, but they don't quite trust him. They listen to what he says, and they weigh the pros and the cons. Um, but in the end, they leave him as well. Because they don't want to, in their noble attempt um, to search for enlightenment or rest, they want to make sure that they're not um, only going for second best. They want to make sure that there's nothing better out there. And so not being content with Christ, they move on. They're at this oasis in the desert, and they think that they can do better because they want the best kind of water, so they leave. And in so doing, they become lost, because this is where the, the water of life is, and they never taste it. They see it, but they don't taste it, because they want to do better. These people may never come back to Christ, because the first time, if they were not content with him, they might not be content with him anymore. Now, the third type is probably the most dangerous, and maybe closest to us, it's uh, the group that wishes for rest, and they identify as somebody who is heavy and uh, heavy laden and weary. But when they hear that they have to take up Jesus' cross, they get scared, or they ignore that part. They either flee or they pretend that they didn't hear. And in so doing, they never really receive his testimony or take up his burden because they pretend that they don't have to. And it's these people who are the hypocrites and deceive themselves. And it might be the group that's closest to who we are as well. So, it's something to think about. Well, the positive picture, I only have a couple minutes left here. The positive picture um, that I want to paint of the person who comes to Christ in his fullness is a person who's self identified as burdened, heavy laden, weary, looking for rest. Um, they, are, they see Christ and they hear his call and they trust him. And not only do they trust him, but they're willing to take up his cross. They're willing to do whatever he says. Um, his, his invitation to them begins with come. But in the Greek, um, the next two words, the, the take up the yoke and the learn from me, those are commands. Those you cannot do away with. If you come to Christ, if you accept that invitation, then it is mandatory that you take up his yoke and you learn from him. And it's really the same thing. So it's not like the craziest burden in the world where he's telling you to go, go save everybody or go be persecuted or martyred or something like that. The real call to take up his yoke is really to learn from him, to learn his ways, to learn who he is, and then to live in light of that. And we all know that this is true. We all know what true loyalty is and if we have it with Christ because we know the conviction from sin that comes when we serve another master. We know that that's wrong, but that could be a good sign too because it shows that we at least have identified him as the one who offers rest. So don't be afraid to take up this load. To do so flies in the face of most of what the world teaches, but uh, let's be committed to the ways of Christ, compassion, servitude and patience and prayer and sacrifice, these things. All right. Well, I'm really out of time, but I just got to conclude here. Um, this message that I made for today was not for unbelievers or necessarily those who are searching, but this was really made for you, Cedarville. Um, this rest is real. This rest will be tangible. And this, there's this reality that we cannot see that would help a lot if we could, the spiritual realm. And in 2 Kings, there's the picture of when Elisha is, um, 
he's on this hillside and there's this army that's come up and he's going to capture him. And his servant is terrified because there are so many more than just the two of them. They have no chance. And what Elisha does is he prays to God and says, Lord, open up my servant's eyes. And when he does, the entire hillside is covered in chariots of fire, an angelic host that's protecting and surrounding Elisha. And I just want to do that for us. I just want to make us aware that this call is real and it's happening. And no, you don't hear it with your ears and you don't see it with your eyes, but, but with your faith, that's what makes this real. If you can hear with your ears of faith, like you will hear the call. And this call to rest is just, it's so good because we're all so burdened and under so much stress and strain with loads that we weren't ever supposed to have in the first place. So take this to heart today. This rest is important to always be thinking about because it gives us the hope, it gives us the endurance, the persistence to live and to move for Christ. All right, you guys can uh, come up now. Um, I'd like for us all to worship together. But I want us to lay aside all the distractions, the homework and the classes and music, cell phones, computers, family, friends, enemies. Put it all aside. Forget everything. Forget even yourself. And I just want to remember and worship Christ today.